Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSI serves as one of the premier inf information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends throughout the cybersecurity and information system science and technology community. As such, our organization supports those working in cybersecurity and the information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services and help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improve DOD cybersecurity information systems, science, and technology. Before we get started today, I wanna to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free Feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. That is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those dialed in on the phone, I'll read the question out loud to the presenter. If you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back to the CSI website once the webinar is posted. The GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. And with that said, I'll hand it off to today's presenter. Hi, thanks, Philip. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Julie Haney. I lead the Usable Cybersecurity Program at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST for short. And I'm very excited to have the opportunity to talk with you all today about a topic that I'm quite passionate about, and that's the human element of cybersecurity and specific, specifically some common human element pitfalls and misconceptions within the security community. Um, I want to apologize ahead of time. Um, I had a cold last week. Yes, people actually still get common colds. Um, and um, my voice has been a little rough, so I apologize if I occasionally cough or have to clear my throat. I have a cup of warm tea with honey and some cough drops just in case, um, but I do apologize if I <clears throat> just have to clear my throat like I just did now. Um, so this talk is going to be probably a little different than what you usually hear during these webinars. Um, this is a talk that I gave at the RSA conference this past June. And for those who aren't familiar with RSA, it's a uh, huge annual security conference that's really targeted at security practitioners. And so my talk was really aimed at practitioners. Um, and so I'm going to be in my talking points. A lot of them are grounded in research, but there's also a lot of real world examples mixed in. So it's not going to be kind of a, a typical research talk that you might hear um, during this webinar. All right, quick government disclaimer, we'll move on from that. Um, so we know that security professionals really do perform a tremendous service and they have the noblest of intentions, but they might be falling victim to some misconceptions and pitfalls that hold other people back from reaching their full potential of being active and informed partners in security. And so the eight pitfalls I'm going to be talking about today really reflect the security community's general tendency to focus and depend on technology to solve today's security problems and failing to fully appreciate that human element of security. 
And by human element, I mean the individual and social factors that impact security adoption. So my goal for this talk really was to get security folks to start thinking about things that might have not been on their radar before, and then prompt them to really start taking that human element into account when they're developing and implementing their security technologies and processes and policies. So I wanna mention that this talk is a no judgment zone. It's not intending to criticize security professionals or the security community as a whole. And it's particularly no judgment because I've been there myself. Um, so before going back to graduate school and moving into more of the usable security research several years ago, I was a security practitioner um, for over 20 years. I actually worked in the Department of Defense and I did vulnerability assessments and wrote security guidance and did a lot of work just trying to convince organizations to adopt various security mitigations. And especially early in my career, um, I definitely learned some things the hard way and I saw other people learning the hard way, sometimes because we didn't consider the non-technical reasons why people and organizations don't always adopt security best practices. So a lot of this talk is really based on some of my own lessons learned, but also rooted in a lot of this usable security research that I've been doing the last few years. So I'm gonna start by talking about some of the foundations for looking at these pitfalls. Um, and in particular, the concepts of usability and usable security. So this is the standard uh, definition of usability. It's an ISO standard, and it's quite a mouthful as many standard definitions are. So I wanna break it down just a little bit and talk about how it applies specifically within the cybersecurity context. So we start with systems, products, or services. And these can be many different things. They can be kind of the traditional information technology like our devices or software or services. Um, they can also be processes. So for example, the steps involved in authenticating to a system, but it could also include security policies or security guidance documents or even security training. And then we have our users and those are just the humans involved in these interactions. And I'm gonna talk more about who those users are in a few minutes. Um, goals are, of course, are just what people want to accomplish when they're using those systems, products, and services. And then we get to effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. And those are really the three core components of usability. So effectiveness is all about whether people can successfully achieve their goals. Efficiency refers to the resources, which could be time or cognitive resources that are used to achieve those goals. And then satisfaction is really this intersection between a user's physical, cognitive, and emotional responses when they're using that system, product, or service, and how well their needs and expectations are met. And then finally, context of use is a combination of a lot of different things. Um, it's the user attributes. It's the characteristics of the tasks and the goals. It's the technical, organizational, social, and physical environments in which people are interacting with technology. So we're gonna be revisiting some of these concepts uh, throughout the whole presentation. So now we get into usable security. So way back in 2009, the Department of Homeland Security identified 11 hard problems in information security research. And one of those was usable security. And what the report said is still very much relevant today. Um, and I love this quote. It said, security must be usable by persons ranging from non-technical users to experts and system administrators. Systems must be usable while maintaining security. In the absence of usable security, there is ultimately no effective security. So usable security involves all those aspects of usability I just talked about and really more broadly considers the relationships and the interactions between people and security, the challenges people have, and how we design those systems, products, or services so that they don't cause people too much frustration while they also result in improved security outcomes. So usable security is really about considering that human element. 
And so when organizations don't consider the human element, there can be real consequences. Um, and we're going to be talking about quite a few of those um, in, the, in the next 40 minutes or so. So just things like more calls to the help desk, people becoming frustrated, thinking that security is inconvenient. So really not contributing to this positive security culture. All right, so if the human element is so important, why is it often overlooked? Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm gonna briefly just touch on four. Um, so as I mentioned before, the cybersecurity field is very technology centric just by nature, where technology is often viewed as the solution to all security problems. Second, most security folks just haven't been trained in the human element and likely wasn't part of their formal or their continuing education. Additionally, taking a human-centric approach might be viewed as being resource intensive and an impediment to getting security implemented efficiently. efficiently sorry. And then finally, security professionals might hold some misconceptions about the human element. And so that's the focus of the talk. So let's hop into some of those misconceptions and pitfalls. All right, so for each pitfall, I'm gonna um, talk about what it is and then I'm gonna provide an example. And I'm gonna be grouping the pitfalls into kind of three bins. Um, and at the end of each bin or category, I'm gonna offer some tips on how to overcome those pitfalls. All right, so our first three pitfalls are all about what happens when you don't take the time to know and appreciate your users. So pitfall number one is not identifying all the users in security. Um, and so this is really about identifying all the people that might be impacted by security. So a lot of people, when you hear the term user, you might tend to think about end users, just like regular people, non-security experts. And we might have a tendency to just lump all of those general users together and fail to account for differences among them that might impact their security behaviors. Um, so for example, within an organization, there might be differences in people's security motivations and their needs and level of expertise, depending on what business unit they're in. So scientists in a mission organization may have very different kinds of security interactions and motivations as compared to HR specialists, by the way. We also might not think of technical folks as being users. So these are people like system administrators, help desk staff, other security professionals, but they're really the ones that have to implement and maintain the, the technologies and processes and deal with the aftermath if something goes wrong. Um, within our organization, developers who have to implement security in their code can be users. Decision makers can be users of security information, guidance, policies, and they have very specific needs and ways of understanding that might differ from those of other stakeholders. So an example of this um, is from my own organization, um, NIST. And we put out, um, many of you are probably familiar with a lot of the security guidance that NIST puts out. And it's very much geared toward organizations. And these publications are often, they're very thorough and detailed, but they can be quite long. Um, and so if we think about, okay, organizations are our tar target. So who are those organizations? Well, they're actually very diverse. So if we think about a larger organization, they might have the security staff able to go through these lengthy documents and kind of tailor it to their organization. But what about small businesses? So they might be required to comply with the guidance, for example, if they're government contractors, but they may have a really hard time going through it, especially if they don't have any in-house dedicated security staff. So are these users being considered when we're putting out all this guidance? So a few years ago, um, NIST stood up a website for small businesses, in particular for very small businesses, like micro businesses. And my group conducted some usability testing with some small business owners. And we found that 
this kind of longer security guidance was very overwhelming for these people, and it was pretty much useless to them. Um, and, and some actually needed help just understanding basic security concepts and risks. So our testing led to some changes to the website to make it more usable for these small businesses. And NIST has also been putting a lot of effort the last few years into trying to take some of these lengthy documents and producing some alternate formats, videos, shorter, um, more prioritized, um, more targeted documents to help these small businesses. All right, so pitfall number two is assuming that users are stupid or hopeless. So over the years, I have been in or overheard many conversations among security professionals who really believe that technology is a panacea and that users are the weakest link. Um, and I've heard things like, well, users are stupid, so we just need to tell them what to do and they just need to do it because we're the experts. So the reality is, is that yes, people do make mistakes, um, but this attitude can really backfire and it creates this us versus them type of situation, kind of this antagonistic relationship. And security folks might come across as being very arrogant and condescending. And it really takes away from user agency. It's really the opposite of trying to empower people. So there's been a lot of research on security non-experts and their perceptions and actions that show that users are really not stupid, but rather they're overwhelmed and they're ill-equipped and not necessarily because of their own fault. So some of my colleagues at NIST a few years ago conducted a study in which they interviewed some general public people about their security perceptions, their challenges, and, and what kinds of actions or mitigations they took. And they found that these people were suffering from something they called security fatigue. So security fatigue is a sense of resignation, <clears throat> weariness, frustration, or loss of control in people's responses to security. And they identified a few reasons why this happens. So first, if we think about it, security is, is most of the time, not someone's primary task. It can be very disruptive. Um, for example, having to go through multiple steps to authenticate, deal with security pop-up warnings. And then people, especially within an organizational context, might think that security is someone else's responsibility. It's those IT folks. I don't have to do anything. It's not my, my duty to do anything about it. And this is really often because they're not experts in this. Um, but we still can hold unrealistic expectations on what they understand and how well they can make these security decisions when we, when we give them information that's not really tailored to their organization, or the, I'm sorry, their understanding. Cognitive biases can also come into play. So for example, people might suffer from an optimism bias where they might think, well, no, one, no one's going to target me. I'm not that interesting. Um, or the availability bias in which they might think, well, I can't recall anything bad happening recently, so I don't have to worry too much. <coughs> Excuse me. The third pitfall <clears throat> is not tailoring communications to your audience. So as security people, we really do have to communicate security information all the time. And we don't think about that so much. Um, but we, we are communicators in that respect. So we might have to let people in the organization know about a new security policy or process or disseminate some kind of security awareness or security guidance or try to convince our leadership to invest more in security. And we might have a really hard time putting ourselves in other people's shoes and seeing our communications through their eyes. So there's a great term called curse of knowledge that describes this well. And it's about how people who are experts in a field have a really difficult time explaining that field to non-experts. And so likewise, security professionals might have a hard time translating highly technical information into a language understandable to their intended audience. They may also have trouble tailoring their security communications 
to appeal to what their audience actually cares about. Um, so I, I have seen um, many instances of security folks talking to executives and like describing some vulnerabilities or some issues, and they go down way too much in the weeds, and you just see people's eyes start to glaze over, and they're really not providing the information that the executives need to make informed decisions, and they're not tailoring it to uh, um, a level that is appropriate for those people that they're talking to. Um, the quote on the, the slide here is actually um, from a participant in, in an interview, a study I did several years ago. And this person worked with security professionals to try to communicate to their, um, to basically the C-suite or their board of directors. And he said, you can produce as many policies and processes as you like, if you can't communicate them to people, if you can't communicate them in a language they understand, in a language that means they're going to be receptive to your message, then they're worthless. All right, so an example from my own um, past. Um, so I mentioned that I um, did vulnerability assessments a number of years ago. And in those early years, after we would do an assessment, we'd go on site for a week or two, and, and um, several weeks later, we'd deliver these thick 100 page plus reports that included a description of every vulnerability we found, what systems were affected, and, and all the recommendations. And these were very much geared toward the technical folks. But then sometimes we returned to a site a couple of years later, and we observed that nothing had been done. Um, and so we really started to th rethink, well, how do we approach these reports? Is, is that appropriate? And we realized that what we were providing was not really tailored to the people that actually made the decisions in the organizations about where these resources would be allocated um, for security. So we then moved to a shorter report format that resonated more with decision makers and then just kind of put all the specifics in that appendix that could be used by the technical staff. So in the main report, we started using less technical language. Um, we started prioritizing the recommendations towards the needs of that organization. So instead of giving them 100 vulnerabilities, we would choose the top, the most important top five for that organization. And then we would include information that decision makers could use to, to decide what they wanted to do first. So things like um, severity of the vulnerability, the consequences, um, and then estimates of overall effort to make the changes. And we saw a big, big difference after that in how receptive people were to those reports. All right, so overturning these pitfalls. Um, all of these things, um, these recommendations are really based on kind of these non-technical professional, um, sometimes called soft skills, which the security community tends to be unfortunately lacking in. Um, but they all are essential for overcoming some of these misconceptions. So the first is um, empathy. Um, this is so important in the security field. So instead of this blame game on, on you know, our users, we need to focus on empowering people to be active partners in security. And this is really a shift in attitude, you know, really realizing we're all human, we all are influenced by our experiences, our level of expertise. So we need to take a step back to understand you know, why are people struggling and how can we help them in that? And a lot of this is really underpinned by our ability to be able to build relationships with people and to listen to them, um, to hear about what are their needs, what are their perspectives. Um, and this also can serve to establish our own credibility and commitment to them. Next, be context aware. So this really goes back to that context of use mentioned in the usability definition. So understanding who are your users? What are their skill levels? What, what, are, what do they value? What's important to them? What are the environments in which they operate? Um, what are their interaction points with security? 
And then being a translator, this is really about communication skills. Um, so tailoring our communications to be understandable to the intended audience. Um, so putting that in kind of digestible terms, um, maybe needing to use some scaffolding to explain basic security concepts, depending on our audience. And then also communicating why this is important. So don't just tell people, do this. Tell them why it matters. Why does it matter to them? Why does it matter to the organization? And then enlist help. Um, so we're not, uh, most of us are not always also trained in communications. So go ahead and enlist the help of the communications group within your organization to put out these security communications. Um, or ask representatives from your intended audience to kind of pilot the communications to ensure that they're understandable and appropriate for that group of individuals. And then mix it up. Use different formats to disseminate your security information because your audience probably has different preferences on how they like to receive that information. Um, some people learn better and prefer kind of interactive type of activities, um, and some are more visual, so things like posters or videos might be more effective for them. All right, so now we move on to the next three set of pitfalls. Um, so pitfall number four is putting too much burden on users. So burden can be in the sense of having to take too many steps to do something or putting the onus on people to figure something out on their own um, when unfortunately they don't always have all the information or knowledge that they need. Um, so if we think about people, especially in an organizational context, they're already really pushed to their limits with respect to cognitive load. So they might be operating under time pressure, juggling multiple tasks, emails are flying in. And so all of this extra um, security burden on people might result in people making errors or people being very frustrated with security. So an example of this um, has to do with the burden on um, developers. So I talked before about how developers are users too. And there have been numerous studies that have shown that cryptographic errors are rampant in software. And one paper estimated that about 83% of crypto-related errors in software are due to developers' misuse of crypto libraries because there's too much burden being put on these developers. So I did a study a few years ago in which I interviewed folks who were developing products that implemented cryptography. And these were an experienced group of individuals who really knew their stuff. But they expressed that the typical developer, and especially junior developers, have a really hard time implementing crypto correctly. So part of this is that people are not trained in cryptography. They don't understand the algorithms. Um, and so they don't understand the different parameters and how to set those to be um, the most secure. And then coupled with that, the libraries that they use are often not usable. Um, the libraries don't necessarily have any kind of documentation. They don't guide them on how to set the right parameters or prevent dangerous configurations. So all this extra burden put on developers results in um, these security vulnerabilities in, the, in these different software products. Pitfall number four is making users into insider threats due to poor usability. So if we have very stringent security measures, those can be seen as counterproductive to people since it really impedes people's ability to be flexible in their day-to-day -day operations. So this lack of usability can result in people being frustrated and then resorting to trying workarounds that end up making everything less secure. Or they might make risky decisions because they're not security experts and they don't always understand what to do or what's at stake. So I couldn't do a human element of security without talking about passwords at least once. 
um, because they're often a classic example of unusable security, especially these password policies that require a lot of complexity, having to change passwords frequently, telling people not to reuse their passwords. And so people have so many different accounts that they have to maintain. And so these complex password policies just really can push them beyond their limits. So to cope, they resort to practices that actually end up hampering security. So for example, they might write their passwords on a sticky note or on an unencrypted text file on their computer, or they might reuse the same password across multiple accounts. So one of the, the best stories, and, and kind of by best, I mean worst stories I've heard, was um, I, I read a, a reader-submitted article in an IEEE newsletter um, about a year ago. And this reader had worked in an organization that had mandated a screensaver kick in after five minutes of inactivity. So most of you probably have this at work. You know, there are there's security reasons of so you don't forget, you know, walk away and, and leave your computer on for a long period of time. But as a scientist, this particular reader said that he was often reading papers or doing other non-computer related tasks at his desk. So the screensaver was activating many times throughout the day, um, requiring him to reauthenticate each time. So he was very frustrated with this. So he decided to devise a method to automatically move the computer mouse to avoid the lockout. So he installed a watch with a sweep second hand under the mouse, which had a motion, motion detector, and it worked like a charm. So he was so proud of his accomplishment, he told his colleagues, and they too implemented this solution. And at the end of the article, he proudly signed his name and said, I got a lot of satisfaction from this achievement. So this is an example of the lengths that people will go to circumvent a security measure that doesn't take their needs into account. All right, so pitfall number six is assuming that the most secure solution is best. So as security people, we tend to want everything to be as secure as possible because that's our job. And sometimes that leads us to recommending the most secure one-size-fits-all approach for everyone. But the most secure solutions might not be practical or necessary in all contexts and might end up having unanticipated consequences. So I learned early on that what might be the most secure configuration might not always be practical. Um, and so I mentioned before that when I worked for DoD, um, I was I wrote a lot of security guidance, and um, specifically for Microsoft Windows systems. And in those um, early days, we decided we were going to recommend the most secure configurations, and we tested them in the lab, and they worked really well. But they didn't always work real well in a real world enterprise and ended up sometimes putting additional burden on the system administrators that we were ultimately trying to help. So let's take uh, Windows event logs as, a, as an example. Um, and this is, my, my knowledge is, is a little dated. I don't, I'm not sure. This is, a, and this is an old um, picture of, I think, probably like back in the Windows NT 4.0 days. But logs in general are, are still around and they're great from a security perspective for seeing um, evidence of, of suspicious activities. So back then in the Windows system, you could choose not to log, which we viewed as like, that's not a good idea from a security perspective. Or you could turn on logging uh, with options to either overwrite the logs as needed, or you could configure the logs to not overwrite. So again, from a security perspective, we didn't want a, the logs overwritten because then you lose this valuable information. So we took the hardline security approach and recommended setting the log size to the largest possible, don't overwrite, stop system if the security log is full, and then told the admins to save the logs off periodically to a backup server so that um, the logs would never get full. Um, so what do you think happened? Well, the system administrators weren't really great at saving the logs off somewhere else, or they didn't really realize that they, they forgot that they were supposed to do that. And so the logs inevitably filled up. And when the logs filled up, 
It turned out you got the dreaded blue screen of death. You couldn't do anything till an administrator manually cleared the logs, essentially resulting in a self-imposed denial of service with lots of calls to the help desk. And it, you can imagine that this was a, an inconvenience and a nuisance on user workstations, but it could be catastrophic on a domain controller. So our attempt at recommending the most secure solution ended up adding much more burden for our users. All right, so overturning these pitfalls. First, um, conduct some basic usability testing. You don't have to be a usability expert. It doesn't have to be formal. Um, you could just pilot some proposed security solutions with representative users, observe the errors they make, any confusion they might express, get their feedback on that. And then provide tools and actionable guidance to help people make the right security decisions. So try to avoid a long laundry list of to-dos that have complicated steps and break those recommendations and security tasks down into manageable and prioritized chunks. Next, try to offload burden. So don't expect people to do the impossible or the overly difficult. Um, we know that there are many things that computers are better at than people. So think about what we can offload to computers. Um, so for example, can more filtering be done at the mail server so few, fewer phishing emails get delivered? Um, the latest um, NIST digital identity guidelines recognizes that usability is important um, for authentication and provides guidance that reduces the burden on users by offloading some of that burden on the back end. Um, so, for example, eliminating uh, the frequent password changes. And then finally, take a risk based approach, um, avoid that one size fits all because um, not everything is appropriate for every um, situation. We don't always have to have the most secure solution. All right, finally, the last two pitfalls. Um, so pitfall number seven is when organizations default to using punitive measures and really focusing on negative messaging to get users to take recommended security actions. So we already talked about how a lot of security solutions might lack usability and people really struggle for all the reasons I mentioned, but then we expect them to always make good decisions and then we punish them when they don't. Well, some of, sometimes negative consequences can be appropriate in some situations um, and others, these punitive measures and focusing too much on negative consequences might actually end up being counterproductive and turning people off from security. They might work in the short term, but they don't help with long-term sustained uh, security behaviors. Um, so phishing um, seems to be a good example of this. Um, so most, many of you are probably aware with phishing um, simulation exercises. So that's when an organization sends out fake phishing emails to see if their people will click or don't click, and it's supposed to be kind of a training experience for them. So I've heard of a company that had a phishing simulation three clicks and you're fired policy. Um, another one had a wall of shame in which the names of clickers were posted in a public area of the organization. Um, but when it comes down to it, anyone can really fall prey to a fish. And there's been a fair amount of research on why some people click on phishing emails and why some don't. And a few years ago, my group looked at this problem in relation to phishing simulation exercises within our own organization. And so they found that in addition to things like some of the typical phishing cues, like spelling and grammatical errors or sense of urgency, that user context was a critical component of why people clicked or didn't click. So if there's a phishing email about something very relevant and in line with the duties of an employee, then that person is going to be more likely to click because they don't want to mess up in their jobs. So in the study that they did, there was a very specific example of a financial group that had recently been late on an invoice and gotten some negative feedback on that. And then a few weeks later, there was a simulated fish that was sent out about an unpaid invoice. And you better believe that the people in that group clicked on that fish 
because they didn't want to let another invoice slipping through the cracks. Um, and so it gets down to like, okay, should we then punish them for trying to be diligent? Like, yes, like they should have looked more and it's a learning experience, but how negative do we need to be? They were just trying to do their jobs. So, so that punishment might not be a good path to go down in, the, in those type of circumstances. And then finally, our last pitfall is about not taking user-centric data and feedback into account. Um, so from a technology perspective, we know that getting good security metrics can be a big challenge. Um, but we also might fail to consider that part of determining the success of our security efforts should be about whether or not users' behaviors and attitudes are being impacted. And if we don't do this, it really results in, in, a, in a kind of a blind spot about what's happening with our users. Um, so as an example, um, security awareness training. So we all have to do this annually, right? Um, we all love it. Um, it's, you know, but it's required in the government. And really this requirement, the intent is to um, help improve people's behaviors when it comes to security. So it's supposed to be very like, you know, that that's the that's supposed to be the impact is improving their attitudes and behaviors. So um, we recently did in my group, we did a survey of close to 100 government security awareness professionals. So these are the people that are responsible for implementing the security awareness programs in their organizations. And we found that over half believed that compliance, meaning everyone completing the training, was the most important indicator of success for their security awareness program. But compliance, like, you know, just completing the training, it doesn't mean that the training was actually effective in meeting its intended goals, which is that behavior change. And we know that employees often find this type of training to be <clears throat> very much a boring check the box activity. They race through to complete it. So how much are they really retaining? What are they getting out of it? What's being translated into actual action? We keep seeing the same user errors and security incidents year after year, but we have no idea what the training is actually accomplishing because we're not looking for those type of metrics. We're just focusing on the compliance metrics. All right, so overturning these pitfalls. Um, so first, don't rely on fear alone. So these fear appeals are really an attempt at scaring people into taking a particular action. And fear can be a powerful emotion, but it doesn't always prompt action. Or if it does, it might be just a short-term thing. It, it doesn't necessarily result in um, this long-term behavior change. So instead, um, well, and first of all, you have to honestly communicate the risk, right? You have to tell them like, you know, there is a risk. This is why you should care. Um, but be careful not to overstate that. But then, um, so that helps with the motivation. But people then have to have some kind of confidence in their ability to do something about the threat. And so they need specific instructions and tools. Because if they don't feel that the actions they're able to take will mitigate the threat, then they're likely to choose not to act. Um, second, try to be positive. So in the studies that I've been doing the last few years, um, we've had a number of participants talk about the benefits of periodically recognizing people who do positive security behaviors. Um, some of them have like these kind of like friendly competitions or they earn virtual badges or get kind of small trinkets. Um, even a personal thank you can really go a long way. Um, there's a book called Fishing Dark Waters that talks about one organization's success, successful paradigm shift to dealing with repeat phishing clickers. So they moved from a punitive stance to one that was more collaborative, and they would work one-on-one -on -one with people to better understand what challenges they were facing and what was causing them to keep clicking on these. And they, they noticed a huge improvement 
um, in uh, those uh, phishing behaviors within the organization. All right, next, um, make sure you gather that user-centric data. So you can kind of think of some types of metrics as an initial identification of the problem, kind of like when we talk about an illness, it's like the symptoms. That tells us that there's a problem to begin with. So for example, help desk calls can reveal things that users are really struggling with. User level security incidents like phishing clicks or security violations can also inform where users might need more support or training or better solutions. But then you have to get to the diagnosis, that root cause. <clears throat> And to do that, you need to understand um, the context people are operating in and go straight to the source. Um, so use those interpersonal skills to gather feedback from your users. Talk with them, um, send out surveys, do focus groups. It could be one-on-one -on -one or small group meetings. Find out why they might be struggling and provide them some kind of feedback mechanism so that they can anonymously communicate communicate their issues with, about um, security without any kind of fear of repri reprisal. And then finally, use the data to actually drive improvements. So do something with it. And then tell employees that you are doing something with that. So communicate to them what you did to make sure that they were considered. Um, what kind of feedback did you get from them? because ultimately people want to feel heard and know that their needs were considered in the whole process. All right, so those are the eight pitfalls um, and just leave you all with some parting thoughts. Um, so considering the human element is really helps security professionals achieve what should be one of their biggest goals. And that is empowering users to be informed, capable, and active partners in security, rather than seeing them as hopeless victims or obstructionists. Um, because in this security problem, I mean, the security realm that we're all facing, all these issues, um, security professionals can't do this alone. Users can't do this alone. We all have to work together. Um, and with that, um, Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity. Um, there's my contact information. Um, my team has a website. Um, we do all kinds of research. I encourage you to check it out. Um, we've done things with uh, authentication, with kids um, and, and security, with smart homes, um, security awareness, um, uh, phishing, all kinds of things. So um, please check us out. And at this time, if anyone has any questions or comments, maybe you have some experiences that uh, are similar to those I talked about that you want to share. Julie, thanks a lot. Uh, that was a great presentation. I think it was very timely uh, with October being Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat just yet, but I do have a couple questions and comments as well. Uh, as we open it up for Q&A. Um, a lot of this actually uh, hit home uh, prior to working at CSI. I was in the DOD as well. I was involved in some of the uh, RMF and DICAP stuff. So I understand, you know, sometimes uh, sending a CSV list or a long Excel sheet of vulnerabilities that we found don't necessarily get home to the, to the senior leaders. Sometimes you got to use visualizations and stoplight charts and things like that. You gotta kind of have to know your audience. But one question I, I would like to uh, lead off with, um, may be hard to answer. Out of the pitfalls, um, is there any priority that you can uh, provide to any of the pitfalls? Or are there any pitfalls that you see more than others or any that you may feel in your personal opinion that are more important than others? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, because I talked about prioritization, right? Um, I think, um, I mean, I, I think the two that I that I think are big are the kind of the attitude that users are stupid or hopeless or the weakest link, because um, mm -hmm. I think that underpins a lot of it. And that and that kind of causes people to not even want to consider users or the human element. 
Um, the second in general are kind of the ones that have to do with the usability, um, you know, just, you know, thinking about, well, how, how is, how is a, a regular person going to deal with this? Is this too difficult for them? Um, because the, these examples of unusable security, they really turn people off um, and they, they are not encouraging people to make good decisions. Um, because they often don't know what decisions to make. So I think if we kind of group those all those usability ones together and then the users are stupid one, I think those are the two big uh, kind of foundational ones. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, I just, for all the attendees, I just put a link to these slides uh, in the attendee chat as well. So feel free to check back to the website, um, download these slides. It's something I'll definitely will be re reviewing as well. Um, when we just uh, got a question in as well. So I'll, I'll read that. Um, so we have a question from Michael. He said, what was the website for the small business mentioned in pitfall number one example? Oh, um, <clears throat> I can't, it's called the small business cybersecurity corner and I will find it and post it in the chat. Yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, that was that was really eye opening because um, we we brought in um, a number of uh, micro business owners to talk with us. And we had them perform several tasks on the website, you know, fun, things that like typical tasks that people would do on it. Um, so it really informed kind of the design of the website and how things were confusing or not. But we talked to them a lot about security and there was a lot of disconnect about um uh, so for so for example, there was one small business owner that um, that said, "Oh, I don't have to worry about security because all of my client records and everything, like I have a service like that I access online, so none of it's stored locally on my computer." Um, and so at the end, like I I kind of talked with her a little bit about, okay, like what if someone got access to your computer and they were able to grab your log on or. Then they have access to all, and, and there was like the light bulb went off. So just things like that where we might take for granted as, as security people that not everyone really, really uh, understand. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I wanted to hit on as well, something that you mentioned uh, during uh, the presentation as well was that um, being from NIST, um, you guys do push out a lot of policies. Uh, you guys do a great job as far as with the change logs and the summaries of those policies. At CSI Act, um, we do host the DOD cybersecurity policy chart, which hosts a lot of the, the NIST policies on there as well. Um, you said that you and your team have looked at um, possible ways to kind of simplify the output of some of these policies that you're putting out, whether they be slick sheets or PowerPoint presentations and things like that. Um, the CSI policy chart is one of our most visited web pages on the CSI website. So if you could talk a little bit about the work that you guys are doing in reference to trying to more effectively communicate, I guess, the content of some of the policies that you guys continuously to push out, I think that'd be beneficial to our members. Sure. Um, I mean, my... <clears throat> My group is more given um, general guidance to a lot of the, the security teams at NIST, um, and they're actually executing it. But um, so I know that like the cybersecurity framework, for example, they have uh, a version for small businesses or they have one that's kind of um, they have different formats where it, it breaks down. You know, it, it is like a slick sheet, like a one or two pager um, the privacy um, framework also has kind of like a like a getting started type of guide. Um, there's some um, there's some videos. Um, so, for example, um, NIST is involved in the manufacturer extension partnership, um, which uh, deals with a lot of small and medium sized manufacturers. They have some great videos that they put together, kind of communicating like, OK, here's why you need to care about cybersecurity. Um, so those type of like targeted things that really try to make it relevant to specific um, like target population of organizations. Thank you. 
And we also have a couple more questions coming in. Our next question from Cynthia. As a supervisor, role playing with the tech team is helpful. Have a member troubleshoot with the user to see how they explain uh, fix actions. More of a comment, but um, yep. not sure if you want to address uh, that comment from Cynthia. Yep. No, great, great suggestion. Great. And our next question comes from Curtis. The principles seem very similar to decades old practices for selling change. Is this new research or well-known findings applied to a new domain? Great question. Um, so a lot of it is uh, new, uh, well-known findings applied to a new domain. Um, and, it's, and it feels like, unfortunately, we have to keep reinventing things or we have to keep educating people in these new domains about things that have been found. Um, so a lot of things I talked about is actually um, part of the risk communication um, domain. Um, there's been a lot of work, especially in, in like communicating um, like hazardous situations, um, um, like biohazards and, and, um, and uh, in the medical field, in the health field, especially risk communication, there's a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, and, you know, security is like risk communication and it's very much similar but there's some unique differences to security as well. So for example, security is much less tangible. It's much more abstract um, than like an illness or something like that. That's something that we can see, we can feel, experience. Um, people don't understand um, security as much. Um, it seems a little farther removed for them. So there's some unique differences in security that, um, that mean that we can apply things that have been learned in the past, but we might have to tweak those a little bit. And we also have to, like I said, educate like this, this new, um, um, new, these people in this new, on these newer fields about like, here's the tried and th true things that have worked in other fields. Here's how you can apply those specifically in security. Great question. Thank you. Uh, monitoring the chat, I believe that's all the questions we have today. Uh, so with that said, I would like, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Julie Haney for her time. Uh, this was a great presentation. Uh, next month, we also have some more presenters from NIST as well, um, presenting on software supply chain security. Uh, feel free to check our website. Like I said, the recording will be up there within a couple of days. We recently just published a state-of-the-art report on deep learning. Uh, feel free to check that out as well. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to me or directly uh, to Ms. Haney. Um, and we will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you.